What's up everyone, this is Feridun, the co-founder of Swiss Swoosh. Welcome to the Swiss Swoosh Intune series. Do you think fully recording for films and games is really fun? If you are watching, it definitely looks like it. But let's ask this question to a Foley artist. On this show, I sat down with Bastian Gerna, the Foley teacher, to discuss his tips and techniques for Foley recording. He shared some fantastic insights as well. Stay tuned for a fun and insightful conversation. Hello everyone, on this bright and sunny day, we have a very special guest, Bastian Gerna. Uh, welcome, Bastian. Thank you. I want to introduce you first. Uh, as I see, you are a Foley artist, you're a lecturer, uh, you're a sound designer and an influencer, of course. You have a background in Ubisoft and Warner Bros, uh, but you're recently focusing on uh, teaching people, coaching people and teaching Foley. Uh, to those who are interested. So can you introduce yourself and your mission with your own words, please? Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's great that we have that conversation and to get to know each other that way is also very amazing. Uh, I, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, my mission basically is I want to share the knowledge I gained within the last uh, 15 years. I'm uh, working in post-production and game audio uh, with people who are either starting out or already working as a sound designer and also want to integrate Foley into their daily life. And also something I realized from elevating from being a sound effects editor to becoming a Foley artist, the thing I never did when I was working as a sound effects editor was that I didn't record my own sounds too much. Um, I just went out for field recording if it was really necessary. Um, otherwise, I was always um, pushing uh, very hard with the sound effects libraries in order to get the projects done. Um, mm -hmm. Now I realize if you have a little corner in the back of your room and your microphone set up, maybe a couple of modular surfaces and some props, you can do a lot of stuff on your own before you even go to the uh, sound effects library and to get that kind of vision into the world and into the audio pro um, community i'm doing my channel the foley teacher and actually I'm, i'm helping people to set up their own um, modular foley corners in their edit suites and um, smaller mixing studios and whatnot and that is my mission And, uh, of course, I'm also working as a freelance uh, Foley artist in my own studio now since um, almost one year now um, and mainly focusing on movies right now, on feature films. Um, and the game audio thing is also slowly, slowly coming back into my life. That's cool. Uh, I've seen your uh, studio tour video, by the way. I'm going to come to that point <laughs> later. Uh, now, as a like ice-breaking question, I want to ask you that If you could only bring one item to your Foley studio, what would it be and why? This is kind of a, like uh, I, a question uh, about an essential item that should exist in a Foley studio. My stone. <laughs> Because, I mean, we, we're not talking about gear. Uh, we talk about items to make sound with. And for me, it is definitely the, the stone I'm using. I have a little stone that is um, poured into concrete. I can even show you. It's right next to me. Yeah, I always have be. it in front of me. Um, maybe a bit dusty. It's heavy. <laughs> it's not yeah, easy to carry. Around 40 kilos, maybe. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is the one thing I would definitely bring. <laughs> okay, that's, that's cool. And um, yeah. You know that the response that we get from our recordings uh, varies greatly according to the the uh, microphone, like miking techniques and the room that we are recording and the type of the microphone, of, uh, of course. And you may have a lot of experience with this. Do you have some tips uh, you can share about this topic? Yeah, I'm basically learning myself regarding with that topic all the time. So my initial learnings up to maybe very recently was 
to uh, manage a small room with also not too uh, far of a, of a distance from the microphone to the sound source because you um, you you always gather all the room from the small room and it will always be this tiny kind of ref early reflection kind of sound that is uh, very easily um, captured by the microphone. Unmasked, you know, you can really hear yeah. it very easily that it's this small room. And even when you work with perspectives and a room mic in Foley, um, I felt this is not really working too good because you always have the same kind of small room kind of perspective you can you can mix in, but there's no real variation within a small room. Whereas mm -hmm. with, when you have a big room at hand, um, the early reflections, they come in very much later because all the walls are far more far away and maybe also the ceiling is very high. So that is a ideal room for, uh, for, for recording Foley and sound effects. If you don't have that, I always argue to stick with a distance that is maybe not more than 60 centimeters, both for your shotgun and also for your big condenser. Um, in addition to that, I developed a technique with a SM7B, um, which I'm treating very heavily towards low end. And sometimes it's necessary to cut a lot of low end on your main mic because your room is very boomy when you walk in the room. And in order to get the low end back, I then um, mix in the SM7B. And uh, now with my studio here, I have a poured concrete and it's very non-resonant, so I don't have that problem. Still, I'm using that microphone because I then can um, create some perspective and um, weight. I can I can design some weight into the footsteps in a way that is very quickly and easy for me because I'm also recording myself. So let's say I'm moving a bit closer with my feet towards the, the low end microphone, which is also very close to my surface. I then can create this kind of proximity, low end beefy aspect in the sound. So imagine someone is walking and crossing the camera. So you have mm -hmm. that moment where it's really close towards yeah. the camera and that I can, I can, uh, uh, insinate, uh, I can, I can design here on the, on the go. Um, yeah. I think the key point here is that uh, you need to know your room, uh, your equipment well, so that if there are some constraints or limitations, uh, you need to get rid of them by by uh, by your creativity. Let's say I, I believe that it increases our creativity. These kind of limitations. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and the, one other thing, um, because I got feedback from some clients lately that um, they would appreciate rather to have a little bit of room on the footsteps, even if it's an outdoor scene, um, than having those heavy transients when you walk on a road with dirt, for example. Mm -hmm. So I tried that now with my current project and moved the microphone even further away. And yeah, I think they are right, even because... You have the ambiences, you have the dialogue, you have the music, and even if it's yeah. a really quiet scene, the the little bit of room that you are recording within the Foley, it kind of disappears within all the other soundscape. And if you can achieve, therefore, a more natural feel within the footsteps, I think the trade is definitely worth it. And uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm basically changing my own perspective about <laughs> the things I teach, you know, just right now as we speak. Yeah, like sometimes quick and dirty is better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you know, the explosion sounds, it's not very easy to create explosion sounds. And most of the time when you record them, it sounds a little bit weird, uh, sometimes thin. That's why most of the sound designers tend to use some additional layers to, to create a huge impact, powerful impact. So... Um, when recording them in your studio, how do you handle some kind of explosion sounds? <clears throat> so recording explosion sounds doesn't really happen often in my case. When I imagine doing this, 
I would then analyze the scene first and, um, and, and look into what is actually needed from my end as a Foley artist. Um, I would believe it is a lot about debris then and maybe some low end deep impacts that I can maybe additionally um, layer for, for the sound effects editors and sound designers that they can use that. And, um, so I think the whole issue with, um, recording those loud sounds and heavy transient sounds is how to capture that, um, in a way that it doesn't, uh, sound tiny, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's also the case when you record body falls, maybe, I think you have two options. One is you, uh, you use a lot of force and um, you have a room that can handle that. Um, and then a more distant miking approach and, I don't know, post-processing and whatnot. Um, this is not my approach because my room is too small and I would rather work with my kind of technique and shape the transients up front with my transient designer and also use a little bit of compression and my um, low end kind of technique that I also explained a little bit before. And then I'm using less force. Actually, I don't use my whole body and let myself fall down on the ground. Um, I would then rather use a little less force and control that more with my ear and my microphones in order to get a very beefy and um, explosive and uh, full sound that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing these kind of tips because most of the time, this is the case, most most of the guys don't have uh, like a, an ideal room. So uh, that becomes a struggle for everyone. Uh, the, you mentioned about debris and uh, you know that capturing sound like debris and uh, crash crashes can be challenging. And uh, when working on a game, uh, I can give you an example. If if a, like a wooden uh, crate is falling uh, down from a like great height, uh, but you don't know how high it is, so it, it may uh, depend on the game physics and etc. So that's why you need to decide the variations in size and pressure when recording all those assets. So how do you approach such kind of uh, re recordings in, in games especially? We always discuss that with um, the implementers and the audio directors. Um, what kind of, um, how many variations they want and how many, uh, intensities. Um, so usually we go with uh, soft, medium and hard, but sometimes they even want more than that. They want, um, I don't know, soft, um, medium soft medium and medium hard and then medium hard hard and very hard i don't know so that is then <laughs> a lot of that is uh, the, the 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 difference between those two is so huge because then you have to really think about how you can define those small differences between the the sections mm -hmm. um let's first start about uh, talking about three levels of intensity so with the soft I try to define the really lowest point possible. Again, with my microphone technique and also the reference loudness in mind, I then see where is the lowest point I can start actually in order to get the levels correct and to build up on that. Because if I'm already too loud on the small or on the soft then how can I build it up towards yeah. hard and loud? Um, and then the medium is basically, yeah, a medium amount of force and level and intensity. And then for the hard ones, because that's exactly what we talked about before, if it is a transient sound, it doesn't do the trick if you just hit the thing harder on the ground yeah. because you get more sound pressure in the room but the, the thing you will record will sound maybe t more tiny than the medium sound. Mm -hmm. So that I work around by using other techniques and then start layering 
uh, for the assets. So for example, I, I try to get the maximum force before I, you know, just record into all my compression and everything and the things get tiny. Mm -hmm. And then I use, for example, an, a contact mic and get a whole different set of sounds that are much more close up, much more related to low end. And those sounds I then, um, I, I edit and layer together with my main assets. So mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that way I can create that um, dynamics of soft, medium and hard. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, it depends on the story. Sometimes uh, most most of the game developers tend to um, include like less assets. Uh, if you are talking about uh, the pressures, uh, soft, medium, and um, hard. And on the other hand, we need to have some variation. So, which means like thousands of uh, audio assets in the game, uh, which which makes uh, create some struggles on the CPU and RAM side. Okay. Um, You know that as a Foley artist and a sound designer, uh, your job is to imitate uh, some of the sounds. Uh, I can give you an example. When I was a kid, when I was watching uh, the documentaries, I um, the, the animals, the real animal sounds don't match uh, the things that I watch on the TV. That was uh, when I realized that uh, the Foley artists are making all those sounds. It was kind of... Uh, disappointing moment for me actually uh, really? uh, you know um, the question here is how how you approach how you imitate your own sounds or manipulate or your own sounds in your <laughs> own studio i recently did a, a nature documentary first time so i had to um i had to do the footsteps for jaguars and um turtles mainly It was about the story about a beach where the jaguars live and their big turtles come and they have their eggs there and then the, the jaguars live from the turtles and all the story about it. So, I mean, I can maybe more or less repeat myself because I use my technique in order to, um, to get this kind of thump, this kind of low end in with my SM7B and... Then I use my fingers, you know, to, to walk the animals. Um, and I try to give them some weight, uh, which is, of course, not true in reality. Um, but for our ears, uh, we, we need that kind of thing. And also what I did for the Jaguars, I did the, uh, four, the, the two feet in front first, and then the, the legs that are uh, at, the, at the end of his body, you know, of their body. So I separated those two because otherwise I couldn't get the really the hang of it with four impacts um, at the same time. Uh, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. If we are talking about some real stuff that we see on the screen, I think it's sometimes easier than uh, creating something for for an imaginary thing like like we we do in games for example there's a stick man or or a huge giant so you you need to see and you need to think of it and create something uh, very very special to it unique uh, to it so so it's become sometimes um, challenging but the creative part i think here is very important So uh, when we jump up to, to the uh, Foley process between the games and uh, film productions, uh, I have another question here. How does the film and um, game game uh, productions uh, differ in terms of Foley, recording Foley? I think the main difference is that um, Film is much more straightforward because you have the timeline, you have your image, and you just have to design the sounds that they match with the image. And you can always test that um, immediately. You know, I just have to play back the scene with my sounds and I can, I can distinguish is it good or not. And with games, it's not that case if you're not implementing the sounds yourself right after you recorded and edited them. So there's the first difference. Um, even if you implement it yourself, you first have to properly name it. You have to edit it in a very different way because 
um, let's say each footstep is one sound asset in the end. So I have to perform the footsteps a bit differently so that my tail is defined and I can then edit one footstep properly. I have to really go in the beginning of the file and find the first transient and don't make any delay in the beginning, even not milliseconds, because I want the footstep to be triggered right away and I don't want to add additional delay. Um, after doing all that, which is always um, uh, related to naming conventions, to Excel sheets, to really being organized and to exporting into the right folders and then uploading it in the right folder in WISE. And if you're implementing yourself, hooking it up correctly with the, with the game engine and all these things, then you can see um, how your footsteps work in the game. And that is not the end of it because you are then dependent on so many factors that the middleware is doing together with the game. So there are, um, uh, there are so many uh, filters and um, uh, I, I'm lacking the terms now, uh, attenuation curves and obstruction yeah, yeah. and occlusion and all these things that play into how your sounds actually being played back in the game. Uh, so you have to get an overview about all this and then maybe ask certain people if you can adjust certain parameters um, before you can actually judge your sound. And maybe then you have to come up with a very different approach in your recordings because the things you might want to change within the middleware, you cannot because other things are dependent on it. So you have to change your approach in recording and get it right for the settings within the game. So that is very different from just recording straightforward to an image and getting it into the right perspective and nuance and detail and level. And because this is all I cannot do with the game. And so performing Foley's for game is feels very unnatural in a way because I cannot decide all the things I would usually decide when I'm working on a movie. Yeah, it's it's much more complex because the implementation uh, has a like crucial role, and um, and you also mentioned about organizing the files. Uh, you you are recording like thousands of stuff at a time. So how do you get organized? That's I think that's one of the very important points for for a foley artist. Is that right? Yes, I mean depending on what it is, if it is assets. I can, I try to, you know, have my, uh, let's say, a certain sound I have to record, I want to do in one take. Um, if I have to layer stuff, of course, I have to do more takes, but then they are in the same place in my door. And, and then I'm editing um, those sounds exactly where they are and get the right markers in. In Nuendo, for example, I use cycle markers. And then I name them correctly. Um, and this is then organized already. It's organized in the DAW. And once I export it, it is already correctly named in the folder that I then upload, for example. Um, if it is um, cinematics, it is a bit more complicated because I have many files in the timeline, but I have to know in which sections I have to export those. So it is not that kind of, uh, it, it is both vertical and horizontal approach of organizing the session. So maybe I make some certain groups, you know, uh, character A, character B, character C, and then also the, the time within the cinematic, uh, let's say the beginning, middle part and end. So I have those definitions and then correlating with the excel sheet i get all the namings right in my head first so that i know okay those those uh, those names have to go into this field of the session and then i just try to be as efficient as possible because yeah. otherwise it's it's you can get lost and even though if you're organized my experience is it takes longer to get the naming in than actually to record all the sounds. 
Yeah, that's an important uh, process. So um, another question about footsteps. And I, I see that um, you are sharing a lot of footsteps recording in, in your um, social media. So how do you approach creating footsteps for a larger crowd? I mean, if that's uh, only one person, it's easy to synchronize in some way if, if you're a good Foley artist. But if if that's the, like huge crowd, like, like an army or in a, in a street, people People are work, walking. So, so how do you handle that? It's um, depending on what it is. In general, I focus on certain areas within the moving image. For example, there's a main character. Maybe I, I will maybe do this character separately. And then there are certain areas, uh, more in the front, more in the back, more in the right, more in the left. And depending on the budget and the time I have, I then go in and record those several areas and then, um, you know, play them back together. And I also use uh, a technique that I record myself seated so I can use then both of my feet in order to... Um, to get a, a double rhythm in. And sometimes I then folk with my right foot, I focus maybe on something specific so that I can have something that I can orientate uh, towards. I'm always looking to my screen, which uh, um, is on with that. There's a movie uh, on there. So I'm looking at that right now. So I'm focusing there and then walking with one foot in sync to something I see. And the other foot, I try to just you know, use in addition to that and create some filling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's how I do that. And uh, I did a documentary where there was um, archive footage of army, second world war armies marching and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, like a five minute scene. And this was like in part of an installation and it was so complex, but I had to do all the armies that were like, coming here and there and from different angles and originally and then within a setting in a theater. Um, so it was basically doing the marching for five minutes in different speeds and different um, angles and different situations. So I ended up um, using all the gear, you know, like I had my, my rifle and some metal items and some leathery parts and whatnot all here in my hand. And I, I then also used my feet and recorded everything at the same time in order to, uh, I don't know, achieve those five minutes of marching in different speeds in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> yeah, I think you need to hire a, an army to record. <laughs> in an I was really way. like, after that, it was really a workout. Yeah, cool. <laughs> because I had to, you know, the, 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 the heavy rifle and stuff, I had to really shake heavily and then walk at the same time and do this like in sync for, I don't know, <laughs> one hour. <laughs> yeah, <it> was... <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, how, how can we make the best use of like lower grade microphones to record for the audio. Just use them. I have like a <laughs> 170 euro big condenser microphone I'm using at the moment. And I own this microphone for more than 20 years and it does a great job. Yeah. You, you need to know your equipment well, right? Yeah, uh, I was lucky just to buy this one. I, I feel it's it's very good value for the money. Um, it's a T-Bone SC1100. And we did, back in the days, we did shootouts for vocal recording with very expensive microphones. And in the end, I wouldn't, I wouldn't care which microphone, to be honest, to, to use mm -hmm. for vocals. Um, I think it's much more about the preamp. Um, other than that, my first choice, if I have more budget, I would always go for the lowest noise floor when we talk about Foley, mm -hmm. because that's always what makes the difference. Um, how, uh, how low is your noise floor? Because when you record, uh, cloth movement, um, it get easy. It, you see easily the difference between 
a low, no a low noise floor and a very low noise floor, let's say. This goes also with high budget microphones. So for example, um, the, the Sennheiser MKH416 in my ears has a lower noise floor than the MK41 from Schoeps. So if I have to choose between the two, I would rather go with the Sennheiser because of the lower noise floor, even though I like the natural sound of the MK41 more. Another question from one of our followers. If you had to record fully in a home studio with, with some background noise, possible back background noise like with fans, distant cars, cars uh, would you prefer a highly directional microphone to capture uh, not capture unwanted noises uh, or with a wider wider uh, polar pattern microphone and then edit it uh, in the in the uh, editing process hmm. definitely the 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 shotgun microphone because even in a controlled environment i feel especially for movies, working with a shotgun works way better than with a big diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, I think if you have that issue with cars and um, noise coming from outside, you will, you will be denoising anyhow. So having less of that to denoise is always better. And, uh, Yeah, I mean, I use my SC1100 for, for cloth movement. And also when I do stuff um, on, on the desk, it's like props handling or stuff like that. Um, and I also use it maybe as a room microphone, an additional kind of source for, for room information. Um, but it is actually not really because of the sound It is more a convenience because I don't want to use my shotgun and, you know, tilt it all the time, tilt it from footsteps back to cloth and then back there. And I don't want to do all the adjustment all the time. I want a setup that is a bit more efficient. And I don't know, maybe I, I someday change the big diaphragm mic against another shotgun. I'm not sure about that, but actually uh, I'm considering it right now because I have some electrical interference sometimes in my room and the, the, the condenser is picking it up way more than the shotgun. And that already is a reason for me to change that. Um, but in the end, it's not about the gear, you know, you can do everything with, with both of those kind of microphones. Mm -hmm. I know Foley artists who work only with a big condenser and, They even do the low-end trick with a big condenser. But you have to treat it completely different than my approach with, uh, with, with, uh, with the SM7B. You know, yeah, the one yeah. is kind of the diva and you have to be really subtle about it. And SM7B is, uh, is a workhorse. You have mm -hmm. to really punch it and give it, you know, everything yeah. in order to get the, 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 the result you want. So it's not about the, the gear. It's much more about how you use it and uh what is your vision yeah yeah okay thanks for all the tips <laughs> and then then we uh, can we talk about um your services what what um, how your students reach you and are you teaching online or on site mm. uh, how, how uh, from where they can follow you so my main platform is instagram and linkedin people can follow me there and also approach me there directly with dm i also have a website uh, where people can uh, apply for my coaching services and can schedule a, a free first uh, introduction introductory meeting with me on on zoom and other than that i'm also teaching on site in different universities um, i'm doing that for uh, game audio lab um, in cologne um and also for sae and other universities uh i'm giving talks and lectures every now and then um yeah basically that's it that's that's great yeah and i strongly advise the audience to visit your website and uh, the, the foley teacher.com right 
Yes. Uh, there's dash between. So um, to and and uh, watch your studio tour. And um, I personally want to thank you that um, about creating a lot of like tons of uh, entertaining and educative stuff that definitely elevates the industry. And um, another secret question: um, What was the medal that I saw in in your studio? Uh, it was hanging on the diffusers. <laughs> <laughs> the swimming medals. I, I'm, swimming. I'm, into, uh, I'm wow. into swimming, yeah. Okay, I, I'm a swimmer as well. Not so oh, really. <laughs> that's the common, yeah. I'm, I'm swimming. Um, I'm uh, participating to open water swimming championships. Oh, well, that is exactly not my thing. I, I, <laughs> I hate that. Uh, I, I, I much more prefer the pool. I want to thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, with our audience and. Uh, we wish you uh, a continued success in your career. And before we wrap up, is there anything you want to add you would like to share with the audience? Yeah, basically that I appreciate the whole um, social media realm and the thing we are doing right now very much. And I encourage people who start out or who just want to get their next gig or they have a vision to to put their to put themselves out there in a way that is comfortable for them um i think we are past the time where a show reel with just some redesign is 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 cutting anything anymore and also uh, knowing why is something maybe five years back was you know giving you some attention when you applied because not many people did know, but now everyone knows that stuff. So you have to kind of stick out of the masses and uh, make yeah. yourself, you know, interesting. So that is always something I try to uh, convey to people who are asking me for advice. If you are comfortable with doing such a thing that you show your um, your face and you explain stuff about you and you make a, a show reel that doesn't just um, show your work, but also your personality and how you are and what it would feel like to have you in the team and if you're funny or not or what What, <laughs> what are you about, you know? So this yeah. is much more important these days, I believe. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. <laughs> so thank you, Bastian. Thank uh, you. Have a great success in your future career. You too. Feridun. Allah razı olsun.